Good morning. Thank you all for joining us for Grand Rounds today. It is my pleasure to introduce our speaker today, Matthew Radcliffe, who is Professor of Philosophy at the University of York in the United Kingdom. Prior to this, he taught at University College York, Durham University, and most recently the University of Vienna, where he was Professor for Theoretical Philosophy and Head of the Department. Most of his research falls within the areas of phenomenology, philosophy of mind, and philosophy of medicine and health, an area that has a very rich history in psychiatry, less so recently, but I think still very relevant to our work. So I'm very excited to have him here with us. In particular, uh, Dr. Radcliffe has sought to show how phenomenological research can be brought into dialogue with psychiatry in ways that are mutually illuminating. In doing so, he has addressed puzzling forms of experience associated with diagnoses such as depression, schizophrenia, and post-traumatic stress disorder. His publications include books, Rethinking Common Sense Psychology, a Critique of Folk Psychology, Theory of Mind and Simulation, Feelings of Being, Phenomenology, Psychiatry, and the Sense of Reality, Experiences of Depression, a Study in Phenomenology, and Real Hallucinations, Psychiatric Illness, Intentionality, and the Interpersonal World. So it really kind of spans the spectrum of you know, psychiatric illness in many senses. His current research is focused around a major interdisciplinary project on the nature of grief. He's also working on uh, the structure of emotional experience, interpersonal and social dimensions of emotion regulation, the phenomeno phenomenology of linguistic thought, the experience of possibility, and relationships between traumatic events and psychiatric illness. His talk today is entitled Trauma, Language, and Trust. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Radcliffe. Um, well, thank you very much for that introduction, and thank you all for coming. Um, before I get into my talk, I'll just put it in context a bit for you to try and give you a sense of what it is that I'm trying to do here and how it is hopefully relevant in some way to psychiatric practice. So I'm uh, a philosopher, and I work in an area called phenomenology, which is the philosophical study of the structure of human experience and encompasses philosophers such as Edmund Husserl, Martin Heidegger, Maurice Merleau-Ponty, and various others. But I try and do phenomeno phenomenological research in a particular way, which is by engaging with puzzling forms of experience that people struggle to articulate and to understand. And in particular, I've been looking at forms of experience associated with various psychiatric diagnoses. So people will say things like, it's, it's hard to explain. It's like the whole world's completely different. I haven't got the words for it. Everything seems strange. Everything seems un unreal. It's as if I'm in some far off land. Um, and people will try and people will struggle to describe these experiences that involve profound disturbances of one's most basic sense of being rooted in a world and one's sense of reality, connectedness with things. And so the hope is that this leads to a kind of dialogue where one can make phenomenological discoveries, where one can learn things about the structure of experience more generally by engaging with this kind of narrative. And at the same time, one can enhance our understanding of forms of experience that are associated with and also central to various psychiatric diagnoses. And the potential implications here take a range of forms. Phenomenology arguably has a significant contribution to make to nosology, and also perhaps to diagnosis, and to various forms of treatment. But what I'm going to focus on today is how phenomenology might enhance um, the understanding of experience within in the clinical encounter, if you like, empathy, construed in a fairly permissive way. And I'm going to focus specifically on linguistic experience. As I mentioned, there are various experiences that people struggle to describe. And you might say that one's words fail insofar as those experiences are themselves intractable and evade language. But there's something slightly different that goes on as well. In saying something, one's words feel hollow. One's words are experienced as somehow misfiring, as incapable of connecting with the relevant phenomenon. In the most extreme case, there's a kind of a, a, a sense that one's words will always fail. One will never be able to convey the experience. One will never be understood. 
and one's words are experienced as such. And I want to ask, what, what does this consist of? How can we better understand a range of experiences that involve this? And I'm going to focus specifically on the context of, of trauma, also grief. And in so doing, I should say, what I'm going to sketch today is fairly abstract, and it's quite far removed from the specifics of clinical practice. But hopefully, you will leave with the impression that this kind of philosophical work does have the potential to inform clinical practice in various ways. If I'm wrong about that, please tell me, and I'll dutifully resign from my position and buy a fishing boat instead. Um, so it's often remarked that extreme forms of traumatic experience defy articulation. And this theme's been noted in particular in the testimonies of Holocaust survivors, where it's a consistent theme that certain experiences that have been witnessed, not sure what's going on here, certain uh, experiences that they've witnessed, certain things they've witnessed and lived through cannot be put into words. They evade language completely. But this kind of language failure isn't specific to Holocaust survivors. It's something that can occur at the level of the culture, the group, or even the single individual. For example, reflecting on her own traumatic experiences, the philosopher Susan Bryson writes as follows. Um, she asks, how can one speak about the unspeakable without attempting to render it intelligible and sayable? And even where the shortcomings of language aren't quite so profound, even when one says, it's not impossible, it's just difficult, there's often a struggle to convey things in words, a sense that one's words are somehow disconnected from what one is trying to refer to. And what I want to do today is focus on a way of experiencing one's words. And I'm going to look at two interdependent factors that I think are involved in many cases. I'm not suggesting that all forms of trauma involve this. I'm not suggesting that all experiences of linguistic in inadequacy take this form. I'm making the more modest claim that some of them do. Um, so the first of these involves a disruption of projects and pastimes that were previously taken for granted as a kind of background to one's life. And the second involves the erosion of a form of trust or confidence, which is nonspecific in nature. And what I'm trying to describe is probably consistent with a range of psychiatric diagnoses. Perhaps PTSD, a more obvious candidate, is the increasingly recognized category complex PTSD. But it's not diagnostically specific. It's likely to feature in a wide range of cases. So how can one understand this theme of the unsayable? Well, here's how Elie Wiesel describes the failure of language in trying to recount his experience of being incarcerated in a concentration camp. So starting with the second sentence here, painfully aware of my limitations, I watched helplessly as language became an obstacle. It became clear that it would be necessary to invent a new language. But how, he asks, can one transform words betrayed and perverted by the enemy? Hunger, thirst, fear, transport, selection, these familiar mundane terms. In that place, they meant something else. So what he's saying is that familiar and mundane words took on different connotations in the world of the concentration camp, where all that was previously taken for granted ceased to apply, where the whole structure of a human life is deliberately and comprehensively broken down. And yet, the more familiar means of the, meanings of these terms continue to be presupposed by interpreters. So here you are in this world relating your experience. You, you have to use terms that others understand. But the very act of using terms that they understand blocks your being able to convey the radically different world that you once inhabited, or in some cases that you continue to inhabit. And this fracturing, this duality, is a consistent theme in various accounts. For example, Charlotte Delbo, another Holocaust survivor, writes of a splitting that encompasses language, reality, and self, this world and that world. So the problem of linguistic expression concerns using words in this context, in this world, 
to try and convey something in that world that is radically different. The by using familiar words, you eclipse the unfamiliarity that is so essential to the understanding. And my former colleague, Martin Cush, refers to this as linguistic despair. He says it's essentially the struggle to communicate, communicate the destruction of much of what in ordinary life we take for granted. So a sense of one's word as inadequate involves the recognition of their being somehow estranged from a context of use, rooted in one context and unable to inhabit another. But once we identify this structure, we can find it in various different contexts. So here's just one example. This is from an autobiographical account of traumatic experiences suffered by an individual, Annie Rogers. And she writes here, it was there as a 16-year-old girl that I stopped speaking. I realized that whatever I might say could be misconstrued and used to create a version of reality that would be unrecognizable, a kind of voiceover of my truths that I could not bear. And I think remarks like this and many others are plausibly interpreted in the same way. There's this sense that when you use these words, they will be, if you like, assimilated into a different reality that impedes the ability to convey the reality that you once inhabited, or in this case, that you continue to inhabit. So, as she says, here's the unsayable. Your words are spoken, but in a way that they are such a way that they're experienced as disconnected from what, you're, what they're pointing towards. The words can't lock onto their reference. So one struggles to convey something in words because something's lost when those words move. And others fail to understand because a familiar context eclipses an unfamiliar one. Um, what I'd like to do now is just explore in a bit more detail what this experience consists of, and just to emphasize again, that it does involve not just a failure of words, but an experience of failure. And to appreciate what this consists of, it's important to recognize that this kind of language disruption is inextricable from a much wider ranging disturbance of one's experiential world. And to get a better grip on this, I'm going to turn to certain kinds of grief experience. Uh, grief is a topic that I'm working on at the moment, having secured a research grant for a big four-year project, trying to better understand forms of grief experience. So think about the case of unexpected bereavement, unexpected sudden bereavement, and in, more specifically that of losing a partner. Now, a prominent theme in first-person accounts of bereavement from a variety of different sources is the erosion of practical meanings. So things that were once given, taken for granted, cease to make any sense anymore. And just to sort of stray into the phenomenology a bit in a way that's consistent with what various authors say in the phenomenological tradition, I think it's important to recognize how the ways in which we experience the world, engage with the world, and think about things are permeated by a sense of the possible. You know, one might naively think that as I look around this auditorium, my experience is restricted to what is actually present, a group of people, some chairs, a clock up there, and so on. But when one reflects phenomenologically, it becomes apparent how the whole scene is imbued with various significant salient possibilities. Most obvious thing being, of course, that all of you appear relevant to me in the guise of interlocutors, uh, whereas that sort of plug point over there doesn't really matter. But the bottle appears significant insofar as I always get thirsty when I'm giving talks. So it appears practically significant in this context, <clears throat> as, of course, does the, project, does the projector the laptop, and so on. So my experience of this room takes the form of a configuration of salient and significant possibilities of various kinds. Something that can be made explicit when we look at experiences where these possibilities are stripped away and everything seems strangely unfamiliar, detached, distant, somehow cold. But importantly, the way, the ability to experience things in these ways presupposes a coherent system of projects and pastimes 
that are habitually ingrained in one's world. What I'm doing now only makes sense in the context of my career as an academic philosopher and the various norms that this involves and so on. Um, various other projects only make sense in relation to my son who's sitting over there playing with his phone. So how, how the world appears depends in part on our various projects. And if those projects break down, then so do the systems of significant possibility that are more usually etched into the experience world. And this is what we see in grief. Um, because almost all of one's cares and concerns, all of the ways in which one finds things significant, can come to depend on a particular individual who is implicated in projects and pastimes in various different ways. I do this for you. We do this together. We're doing this into all, in order to achieve something for us. With that person's death, the whole system breaks down. Um, in the case of a partner, you know, it might just be taken for granted. It's, I cook meals for us. We enjoy walking in the park together. We're saving money for our life together, and so forth. So, after the death, habitual patterns of experience, thought, and activity uh, no longer hold together. It's not that everything disappears in an instant. Bang, there goes the habitual world. It just vanishes. Rather, there are a range of tension-riddled experiences involving habitual systems of possibility and the realization of their negation. There can be localized experiences of incongruity and tension and absence. For instance, a sofa in one's lounge might continue to offer familiar possibilities that imply the partner's presence. Um, and yet those possibilities appear as negated or as unrealizable. And there may also be a more diffuse experience of estrangement and detachment. As C.S. Lewis writes in his famous memoir, A Grief Observed Here, the act of living is different through and through. Her absence is like the sky spread over everything. And this is the context in which I think we need to understand a certain kind of linguistic experience. Our words, too, have various significant possibilities attached to them. They're hooked up to habitual practices and projects and so on. Just as one might get two bowls out of the kitchen cupboard, put them on the work surface, and be struck by the unintelligibility of this behavior following the death of a partner, one might say something or think something linguistically and again be struck by the unintelligibility of this. This doesn't make sense. This doesn't apply anymore. Let me give you a specific example to try and get this across. There's a subtle kind of what you might call self-referentiality that's implicit in a lot of our everyday talk and is often missed. But again, bereavement and other forms of upheaval make this salient. So take the utterance, I'm going home now. You get up from the bar, you say, I've had enough, I'm, I'm off home. Now, the most salient aspect of going home on certain occasions might be going home to a particular person, immersing oneself in activities that imply that person's actual or potential presence. So when habitually thinking or saying, I'm going home now, time to go home now, the bereaved person may be struck by the recognition that this is impossible in much the same way that the pattern of habitual activity is impossible. The words as they're uttered ring hollow. There's a way in which this no longer makes sense. It's not simply false. Home has diff various different connotations. It's true that I'm going home. I'm going back to my private residence. But I'm not going back to that. I'm not going to back to that place that was ours. So there's a kind of tension here between connotations of home that ordinarily hang together. And the best description of this experience I've found is from the um, writer Joyce Carol Oates in her memoir of bereavement, A Widow's Story. And in the passage I'm about to put up, she reflects on this sense of impossibility attached to thoughts of collecting her husband's belongings from the hospital where he's just died and bringing them home 
So here's, here's how she does this. So someone must have instructed me to undertake this task. Not certain I could have thought of it myself. The word belongings is not my word. It's a curious word. It sticks to me like a burr. Belongings, to take home. Home, too. A curious word. Toiletry things that were his, but are no longer his. Seems to me very strange. Now they're belongings, your husband's belongings. One of the reasons I'm moving slowly perhaps is nothing to do with being struck on the head by a sledgehammer. These belongings have nowhere to go except home. And then she says, this home without my husband is not possible for me to consider. So again, you see how the word just can't lock on to one's current reality. And importantly, this kind of self-referentiality can extend to almost any utterance you can think of. I'm going to the park, I'm going to the cinema, I'm just popping down the road to the supermarket. Almost any, any utterance concerned with the structure of one's life can be affected in this way. Um, such experiences comprise only one aspect of grief, which can be variably salient, and they're not specific to grief either. But the example is one that I'm using to illustrate something much more general, a way in which words can be experienced as somehow lacking in the face of profound upheavals, which may take a range of different forms. And this is one of the reasons, I think, that certain traumatic experiences are reported as difficult or even impossible to express. Utterances are imbued with significant possibilities that relate to one world, but not to another. And this is then compounded by others' failure to recognize that one is indeed experiencing such a profound disturbance of world, instead interpreting what one is undergoing in a shallower, more superficial way. So this is one factor, but what I want to suggest is that this is compounded by an additional factor in many cases. And it's when you put the two together that you get a form of experience that is compatible with a diagnosis of severe psychiatric illness. And the second factor I want to consider is the erosion or loss of what we might call trust. Now, traumatic events of the kinds that people often struggle to articulate often involve suffering inflicted by other people often deliberately and with the intention to cause harm. Now, for most of us, most of the time, we might distrust various people in one or more contexts, but our default orientation, if you like, our default expectation in encountering other people is that in their various roles, they'll be mostly benevolent and mostly dependable, even in academic departments. They won't beat you up for no reason. They won't give you false directions just for a laugh. And they might even offer you some support in times of great need. But what we find a consistent theme in studies of trauma from various different theoretical perspectives, and also in almost every first-person account of traumatic experience, a consistent theme is the erosion of this default orientation. It's not that one loses trust in this person or this person to do that or in this whole group of people, or everyone in this academic department. Rather, it's something even more encompassing. The capacity to trust, the capacity to adopt a certain form of expectation in relation to the social world is compromised. So here's how Judith Herman puts it in a very influential book on trauma. Traumatic events call into question basic human relationships. They breach the attachment of families, friendship, love, community. They shatter the construction of the self that's formed and sustained in relation to others. They undermine belief systems that give meaning to human experience. They violate the victim's faith in a natural or divine order, and they cast the victim into a state of existential crisis. But we will find complementary statements all over the place. I'll just go through one more of these. This is just something I found on the website of the Refugee Health Technical Assistance Center in Boston. So 
what we have first of all is a description of the many kinds of horrific things that refugees are forced to undergo. Imprisonment, torture, loss of property, malnutrition, physical assault, fear, rape, loss of, loss of livelihood, uh, being robbed, uh, being forced to inflict pain on others, witnessing the deaths of family members. And what is then said is that is what, what uh, is then singled out as most significant is having been betrayed in one or another way, either by their own people, by enemy forces, or by the politics of the world in general. Having misanthropic actions of others become a major factor controlling the lives of refugees has significant implications for health, ability to develop trusting relationships, for things that are critical to resettlement and healing. And again, one can find so many different and complementary descriptions of the erosion of trust in relation to various forms of traumatic experience. And the common theme is a, an enduring, non-localized loss of a kind of trust or confidence, a, a style of expectation that's ordinarily implicit, taken for granted. And this overturns previously established patterns of expectation in various contexts. So how does this relate to language? Well, almost all of our projects, pastimes, and habits depend in some way on others conducting themselves in a certain manner. Our whole lives are held hostage, if you like, by the, the social world. But everything that we try to do is dependent in some way upon others. Our projects can only be sustained insofar as we are able to trust. So suppose that you have a profound loss of trust. If you can't depend on others at all, then you can't depend on anything. Given the ways in which our various projects and pastimes are dependent on certain kinds of expectations concerning other people in general. And if you can't depend on anything, importantly, the ability to assemble meaningful life projects, to project oneself into the future in a hopeful way, is compromised. And yet that ability to engage with a meaningful future where positive development is possible, that's essential to being able to interpret past events and reinterpret them and reframe them to move on, if you like. So, the suggestion then is that in the most extreme cases, the world appears bereft of possibilities associated with trusting relations. And those possibilities of trusting relations include possibilities for sustaining, repairing, revising projects relating to people in ways that open up new life possibilities. With no prospect of trusting relations, the future lacks a kind of openness, spontaneity, and potential for positive change that most of us take for granted. How does this affect language? Well, if the future offers nothing different, in short, there's no prospect of overcoming the limitations that I described earlier the inability of words to connect, the estrangement of words from their object. There's no prospect of opening up new communicative possibilities. So, as one might put it, in its most extreme form, this loss of trust freeze frames the inadequacy of language I've described. Words don't just seem hollow, they seem irrevocably hollow. The hollowness is not something that one can ever transcend. But that would be a very extreme scenario I think there's also a, a more subtle, quite interesting way in which a lesser erosion of trust can exacerbate language failure. And to try and spell this out, I'm going to turn to the philosopher J.L. Austin's famous book from 1962, How to Do Things with Words. And Austin discusses what he calls illocutionary acts. 
And that's just where we do something by saying something. We do this all the time. So examples of illocutionary acts include things like announcing. Now, I'm not just hurling out a series of propositions. This talk also involves various different kinds of linguistic acts. I might suggest in various contexts. I might, I, I might announce, pronounce, question, answer, advise, suggest, order, promise, warn, inform, and so on. And interestingly, Austin says that all of these acts, these illocutionary acts, like any other action, can be successful or unsuccessful. And their success is contingent on their uptake on the part of others. Do you recognize me as promising? Do you accept that I'm promising? Do you recognize this as a suggestion? Do you recognize that I'm putting forward an argument? And so on. And Austin suggests that when we interpret each other in everyday life, this involves recognizing a vast number of different elocutionary acts, which he classifies in this rather awkward way into five categories. Brilliant philosopher, but not one for coining catchy terms. So he identifies these broad categories, vedictives, giving a verdict. The next one that I can't pronounce, exercising powers. <laughs> Commissives, committing oneself to doing something. Behabitives, awkward but pronounceable. And this is a more heterogeneous group concerning social behavior. I congratulate, I apologize, I curse. Then expositives, which philosophers use all the time. I argue, I concede, I suggest, I reject, and so on. So our ability to interpret others is contingent on being able to engage in these elocutionary acts and to have them taken up by others. And the experience of being able to communicate involves experiencing one acting in these ways and others taking them up. As a brief aside, when one goes back to Austin in 1962, as a philosopher, one then starts to wonder why on earth analytic philosophy of mind thinks that understanding other people consists almost exclusively in identifying little states in their heads called beliefs and desires and attributing them in order to predict and explain behavior. It is absolutely ludicrous if you've ever come across it. But Austin recognizes this amazing complexity. And how is it relevant? Well, here's the last piece in my puzzle that I'll finish off with. To anticipate and experience other people as taking up one's utterances, in certain ways at least, requires trust. And where that capacity is diminished or absent, a respondent's words and deeds will be interpreted in terms of a restricted range of elocutionary acts. If my capacity of trust is eroded, if I can't contemplate the possibility of others offering sincere, genuine, understanding support, I'm going to interpret, indeed experience, their elocutionary acts accordingly. The very prospects of someone sincerely promising, encouraging, advising out of concern, or questioning out of well-being curiosity don't arise. The interpersonal world is bereft of such possibilities. The entire realm of the interpersonal is like watching Boris Johnson on television giving a political speech. So, There's a sense of communicative failure or futility here that may even be further exacerbated by an interlocutor's genuine failure to appreciate this predicament. So on the one hand, the person has a sense that certain illocutionary acts have to fail. They can only misfire. There's no prospect of them being taken up in this hostile social world. And at the same time, because the interlocutor doesn't recognize this, how a profound erosion of trust shapes one's experience of communicative poss possibilities, the interpreter does indeed get things wrong. So to put it in a very general way, the feeling of being understood will be lacking. Gestures that might otherwise be taken taken to signal understanding and concern on the part of others will be taken as indicating something else. And once you start thinking in these ways, you spot various examples in the literature. 
that fit the account. So here's just one from Jonathan Shea's wonderful book about um, the experiences of Vietnam combat veterans uh, called Achilles, Achilles in Vietnam. So as he puts it, the, the moral dimension of severe trauma, the betrayal of what's right, obliterates the capacity for trust. And then more specifically, the customary meanings of words are exchanged for new ones. Fair offers from opponents are scrutinized for traps. Every smile conceals a dagger. You don't recognize the smile of the smile as sincere. In the most extreme case, the sincerity of the smile doesn't even crop up as a possibility. So consequently, many kinds of illocutionary acts seem futile, destined from the outset to fail. And what I want to suggest is that at least some forms of traumatic experience involve uh, an experience of linguistic failure along these lines. You combine this with the kind of meaning loss that I described earlier, where words are experienced as estranged from habitual contexts of use, and what you have is a, a profound, pervasive, but also elusive experience of an inability. So if I'm right that linguistic ability is sometimes impeded in these ways, and if I'm also right that the nature of the impediment is elusive and often poorly understood, I think there are potential implications here for how we respond to experiences of trauma in various contexts, including clinical contexts. So I will stop there and see what you make of that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. That's, um, you know, uh, we were talking earlier before we started that um, you worried that it wouldn't be relevant to psychiatry and psychiatric practice in an immediate sense. Mm -hmm. But I think you shouldn't worry because I think what you've just done is demonstrated beautifully what in fact is the core of actually psychiatric training and psychiatric understanding. Because language of course is the, mm. it's the uh, connection that we all have with mental illness. And most of us in this room we have spent a lot of time, even if we may not consciously recognize that, in trying to pass out the, the details which you are describing so beautifully in, in your lecture here. The way in which we understand the inner life is, of course, through language, yes? Mm. And so most young psychiatrists have to spend a lot of time trying to figure out what that language really is. And if you take the mundane example of grief, which you did at the beginning, that's beautifully said, as you did say it, because it's the disruption of the usual awareness, the lounge chair that you were talking about, etc. The fact that they, it's, it's like taking the lounge chair away. Suddenly that disruption creates for you a whole new perspective. Mm. That's what very often the patient comes in and talks to you about. It may not be driven by grief. It may be driven by some yeah. strange loss of the connectome, which is in our heads. And one of the things that has happened, I think, in modern psychiatry is we've moved from the entire dependence upon language to a biological reference point, mm. which may then, in understanding the brain as a very complex city, if you will, of different parts that join together to talk to each other, that is becoming dominant. One of the problems for us, which I think you can help us with, is that there is a sudden sort of excitement about, oh, well, biology explains this, mm. but it doesn't. What explains it is, as you said, both the subjective and the objective experience. The subjective experience of trauma disrupts that connectome that we're trying to figure out biologically, and it disrupts in that presence the philosophy of how we talk to each other through, through the extraordinary ability that human beings have to express these funny noises that make meaning real. So I, you shouldn't be concerned about the fact that you're irrelevant psychiatrists, because I think you're extraordinarily relevant. Okay, thank but you, thank with you that, very much. I really appreciate it. <laughs> very reassuring that, indeed. Open it up for, for questions.
Dr. Marder, and then Sir at the back, and then here. Yes, thank you very much for that talk. I mean, I, I'm very interested in psychosis, and, in, and I'm wondering if you've thought at all about uh, how people with psychosis, an illness in which trust dim, dim, diminishes and goes away and then comes back sometimes when they're treated, how that affects language and, um, you know, you know in, in something like, like psychotic people. I, I have done. I, I published a book in 2017 called Real Hallucinations, where I looked at loss of trust, loss of trust in psychosis, and tried to argue that essentially a, lot, a, a profound, all-enveloping loss of trust in other people can estrange one from socially distributed self-regulation mechanisms that ordinarily hold together the integrity of experience, and that without this one's sense of the distinctions between even perceiving, imagining, remembering, and so forth can break down in general and more localized ways. Uh, something I'm still not quite sure about is how exactly we should relate the topics of trauma and psychosis. I mean, there are a lot of conflicting claims out there in the literature, but the kind of predicament I was describing, the most extreme form, I think would be consistent with a form of psychosis. And again, the kind of linguistic impairment I'm trying to describe, the, the sort of linguistic, the sense of one's words as hollow, we find this in accounts of psychotic patients as well. Um, repeating something, you know, I say the words, but it's as if they mean nothing. I keep repeating it, but the words don't connect with anything. They're just noises. It's as if they're cut off from the world. You know, if I look at that chair there, it seems strange alien, not quite there, bleached of its usual familiarity. I say chair, 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 in an attempt to summon a sense of its presence, to rekindle it, and yet the words misfire, the words can't connect with the chair, and the words themselves seem hollow in the process. So, so yes, I would want to make that connection, thanks. Thank you very, very much for the talk. I, I appreciate it, and specifically appreciate your ability to kind of translate this material and make it palatable to <laughs> a clinical audience and, and make it relevant to a clinical audience. Well, one thing that strikes me, you're talking about, I guess, the uh, personalized definitions of mundane words um, and, and how those definitions really shift and the meaning of those words shift from individual to individual is the discrepancies that develop between patient and physician in terms of the words that patients are saying is not necessarily what we're taking in. Um, that could be said also in terms of narrative discrepancies. The stories that a patient is telling mm. is different from the story that we're translating it into. We're translating into more of a clinical story. Mm. They're having a derealized experience and we're translating this into a first break psychosis, so to speak. Um, and I guess my question for you in light of what you're saying, when it comes to our clinical terminology and when it comes to our diagnostic categories that we translate patient experiences into, um, are those things that are helping or hurting us in the care of patients? Oh, uh, I don't think there's a simple answer to that. I mean, I suppose there's one case you, you, you could take a case where a patient is expressing a certain kind of narrative, and if you like, the clinician is hearing that narrative in a certain way, where the, uh, a, a certain diagnostic system and broader way of thinking is acting as a kind of interpretive lens that filters out the patient's testimony and blocks understanding. So clearly in an extreme case like that, these categories would not be advantageous. Um, however, and I would say more, more, more generally, one can think in terms of these categories, but it's how one relates one's own clinical understanding to the patient. So the, I think there are various different scenarios where the, the clinical narrative could impede the patient's ability to express themselves, the sense of uptake, the sense of trust. But I don't think it needs to. I think it's quite a complicated territory. There was another, ah, oh, there we are. Thank you. Um, thank you for your talk. So I, I'm trained in mentalization-based therapy for borderline personality disorder. I would guess that you might be familiar with that. Sorry, what, what form of therapy? Mentalization-based therapy. Yeah. Mm. Um, I, the guy down the road from you, Peter Fonagy in London, yes, who developed yes. that. Um, so I, I would, so the question from the gentleman earlier, what I do a lot is 
help people make sense linguistically of experiences that don't make sense to them. And I think that's where our nosology helps, that they actually find relief yeah. from knowing that an, to something that is to them not understandable can be understood. Uh, my question for you was um, thinking about trauma and communication. You were talking mainly about trauma that is inflicted on people mm, yes. with a behavior of some kind. And I just was curious if you would have a different take on trauma in the sense of neglect. Uh, yes. Um, I'm referring more specifically to borderline personality disorder. And Not necessarily, but, no. Um, but, th but thinking, thinking of borderline in yeah. relation to early childhood trauma, I've got a slightly different account of that in a paper. Mm -hmm. um, what, well, I can't even remember what it was called now. Um, no, I can't remember it, but it's on my Academia EU, EDU page. But it's a similar kind of account where what I try and suggest is that there, there's, there's a form of emotion dysregulation, which isn't to be understood in terms of emotions being somehow intrinsically unstable, but rather the ways in which emotions ordinarily operate um, break down because um, a stable, structured, meaningful world uh, shaped by one's various projects was never quite formed to begin with mm -hmm. and one's relations with others are impoverished in various ways mm -hmm. um, and that would be I think consistent with Peter uh, Fonagy's approach um, so so yeah I I focused really on sort of the kind of ex some of the examples I used involve singular traumatic effects impacting upon adults who are previously cozily immersed in the world, and that's an oversimplification. Um, nobody's that lucky to begin with. Um, some people maybe are. But yeah, I mean, you, you, d different traumatic events at different stages in life are going to affect different people in different ways, dispose them to further forms of trauma, partly through uh, loss of trust and disposition to certain kinds of interpersonal relations. So yes, there's a much more complicated, but I think in, in entirely compatible story to be told about that. Thank you. One of the, oh, here's a question over here. But I just, in the meantime, uh, the, you know, the, the, I think the start of discussions of this sort, which are very complicated, is to be self-referential. So if you think about all of us in this room, I'm sure have lost somebody or lost some opportunity that we thought we had for certainty uh, bound to ourselves and to the future. So if you think about that and you introspect on the experience of that loss, whether it be through grief as you did at the very beginning, you begin to see the disruption in yourself. You, I remember after my father died, I could not really organize the world for quite a long time. But what happens is that one goes back to that familiarity and the words then begin to make sense again. Mm -hmm. Most of the people who have psychiatric illness, that doesn't happen for them in quite the same way. Yeah. So the loss of trust is even more complex there because they not only lose the trust of the outside world, but they lose the trust of mm. themselves. Yeah. yeah. But anyway, we can come back to that maybe, but there's a question over here. So, a uh, wonderful talk. What I've been wondering is if language is a special case here. Or rather, is it not the case that, uh, as one very depressed patient said one time, even moving across the room, so everything, each of the modalities, lose their effectiveness to bring the patient out of, whether it's trauma or uh, depression, is that the patient is in another world, mm. and this world does not feel accessible to the person whose language no longer feels effective, but just about everything. Mm. And so when the, uh, that beautiful quote about belongings, it is the language of belongings and indeed, there's something so important how the belongings have to mm. change. But I wouldn't say that it's language per se, but all of the embodied self that is brought into another world and wants to recover back. Mm. Uh, and finally, I would say that ruminations are a way of trying to recover mm. language as effective, and it just keeps getting worse. Um, yes, I, I would agree with you entirely. And I published a book on depression in 2015 and in fact said much the same thing about rumination. So 
uh, one's world, if you like, is bereft of certain kinds of possibilities, which means that the, the rumination just keeps going round and round. So, so yes, the, the language, the linguistic experience I'm talking about would have to be construed as a much wider ranging um, transformation of how one finds oneself in a world that encompasses world experience, self-experience, sense of agency, sense of time, uh, habitual and non-habitual thought processes and so on. And I guess the, the, the reason I focused on language is I think in, there's a tendency to think of the linguistic problems as symptomatic of this, this wider disturbance. So the language fails because your world is profoundly distorted in this way that's difficult to express. And I've made that assumption myself in past work as well. And what I've increasingly come to, to recognize is that there is also a more specific experience of language itself. It's not just that the language fails because the world's defamiliarized. There's a defamiliarization of language. So what you need is a, a conception of language as not just pragmatically embedded, but experienced as pragmatically embedded. So in short, I agree with you. This is meant to be a specific focus on one aspect of a, of a wider experiential change. But that's, that's a continuum that you just spoke of. And I think if you if you think about the fact that they are both contributing, that's yeah. what happens, of course, in the clinical setting. Yeah. So that's, uh, but uh, it's a, uh, it's a fascinating uh, exercise. You should come back and spend three months with us. That, that'd be fun. <laughs> it could be fun. You want to spend great three fun. months here? Yes. <laughs> Uh, yes. Um, when I used the term empathy, I was thinking in a very permissive sense of an understanding of someone else's experience. Now, empathy is often com conveyed, often construed in philosophical circles as a matter of so-called simulation. So somebody's having a certain experience, and then to understand it, you try and have the same kind of experience, and then you attribute it to them. And I don't think of empathy in that way at all. I think empathy centrally involves, in many cases, not having an experience that is similar to someone else's, but recognizing the profound difference between self and other, and being affected by that difference, and being able to convey one's being affected. And it should be construed in clinical contexts more as a kind of dialogical, participatory process than a singular act of phenomenological recognition. We have three minutes. Anybody has one further question? Otherwise, I'm going to pass you. Ah, okay. I loved your literary, reference, your literary references. So how would you say using language effectively to have somebody develop trust and, and reestablish trust and hope and um, is there anything that you've found particularly effective linguistically in moving forward? And then just a comment, I, I kept thinking about paranoid personality disorders in terms of like the, the benign comments that are absolutely just distorted, but anyway. Um, no, that's, a, that's a very interesting, interesting question. And I, I mean, the, the, I suppose the honest answer is, um, that there may be some cases where the loss of trust is so profound that there's not much that one can do. But I'm certainly open to the possibility that for, for the majority of people, um, a prof an experience of a profound, profound and pervasive experience of dis distrust is something that can be overcome in certain contexts to certain degrees with certain people, be they family members, friends, or therapists. The question of how exactly one could do that, what kind of language one might employ. I, I'm not there yet. I, I would feel I'm out of my depth and that many of you are much better qualified to comment on how this is achieved. But there, there are some, ex some attempts to formulate this explicitly. And again, referring to empathy, there's quite an old book by Leston Havens uh, where he tries to explicitly formulate um, uh, various uh, ways in which one's empathy can be conveyed linguistically. And he does so in a very sort of nuanced, complicated manner. So I think it can be done, but I, I, I just don't have the right kind of experience to undertake it myself. Thank you. <laughs>
not the reason why you should come back. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much. That was thank a wonderful you. talk. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you all for coming.